So folks, we're on to the next lesson, and maybe you remember saying you're going to like this one because it's going to feel familiar. You're going to be like, yes, I have heard these words before. These are not things that are new to me until we get to the very end, and there's probably one thing that you haven't heard of before. Or maybe you have. I don't know. Now, we are talking about, in lesson three, population and community interactions. So if you recall what a population is, it was like the very first definition in this unit. Same species, same place, same time. Now we're going to consider interactions between members of a population, but also between different populations. So not just one species at a time, but species interacting with each other and interacting with their entire community. So multiple populations, uh, including the biotic and abiotic factors uh, in an environment, all that kind of jazz. Now the first interaction that we'll take a look at is called intra, with an A, intra-specific competition. Basically every competition question I've ever seen test-wise uses this one and the next one together because they're really similar in terms of how the word sounds, but they mean something different. In intra, with an A, specific competition, this is competition for any type of resource, shelter, or mate, for example, between members of the same species. So intra, with an A, means same species. So in my little picture here, uh, that's a kangaroo fight happening. I don't know if you guys have ever watched kangaroo videos, just like a general thing. Kangaroos are vicious. Every video I've ever seen, because of course who's going to take a video of cute kangaroos, is always kangaroos kicking people or punching people or punching each other. Um, but these kangaroos are fighting over something. Maybe that lady kangaroo over there on the side, I don't know what they're fighting for. But that is intra-specific competition. Same species, so within a population. The flip side of that is inter, with an E, inter, specific competition. So intra is the same species. Inter, specific competition with an E, is competition for the same type of stuff, resources, very often it's food, shelter, or we could even say like land or area that they're going to exist on. This time between members of different species. I feel like I use lions and hyenas a lot as my examples of this, so I've talked about the Lion King. Uh, but there are hyenas and a lion fighting over something, a carcass of some sort that they both would like to consume. Uh, Simba's probably going to win. That's what the Lion King taught me, is that the lions always win. Uh, but that is inter-specific because those two are not the same species. Now, like I said, these two types of competition regularly get put as two choices in a multiple choice question. Uh, and invariably, people pick the wrong one by accident. They'll look and say, oh, I knew this. I just didn't look at the word closely enough, right? Inter, intra, inter, like it looks very similar. So just really be careful when you're doing tests and you have competition as your choice. Now the next type of interaction is the ones between predator and prey. So I put in parentheses there consumer interactions. I like to remind people that plants can be consumers too, depending on the scenario. So here's a Venus flytrap plant sort of consuming its prey. And there are other types of plants too. There's this one called a pitcher plant. It literally looks like a pitcher, like a jug that you hold water in. And it's got this goop at the bottom uh, and stuff falls in the goop and the plant has, this, uh, has these enzymes that break down little insects and stuff super gross. Uh, but generally I think at this point in your life uh, you've heard of predators and prey before. Just so we're clear, like predators are eating their prey. This is a consumer interaction 
And it's not always the same as killing, right? And I like to make that distinction. Um, in my last slide, the lion could have killed the hyena and not eaten it, and it wouldn't have been a predator and prey interaction. It would have been interspecific competition. If there are foxes who are going to eat bunnies, uh, like in this fictitious graph, uh, there would be my predator, the bunny would be my prey. And what I like to always make mention of here is that population sizes change proportionally in cycles when you have predators and prey. And we're going to do some calculations about population size and population change in the next lesson. But if you take a look here, the blue line is the bunny and the green line, those are the foxes. As the population of bunnies increases, shortly after the population of foxes does too. Why? They have more food. As the population of foxes increases, the population of bunnies go down. Why? There are more foxes, so they eat more of the bunnies. And then the same cyclic pattern continues to happen over and over again until something else disrupts these populations. So that's intraspecific competition, interspecific competition, and predators and prey. The next point I like to make is that organisms have defenses against predators. So uh, if I'm an organism that something is going to want to eat, I need to protect myself somehow. I don't want to be eaten, even though I know it's the circle of life and everything. Uh, so there are different categories of defenses that organisms can use. For example, some organisms will have chemical defenses something like a venom or some sort of toxic substance that either they can produce or that is secreted on their skin or something like that. So if we consider the example of venom, let me use my snake example here. There are these two types of snakes and I'll mention them again here. One of them has venom, the other one doesn't. Uh, but snake venom would be chemical defenses. Some organisms, uh, and it doesn't just have to be animals, could be plants, have protective bodies. So for example, a plant having thorns, that's a defense that they have against something eating it. Uh, other organisms might have like a shell, or if I'm a porcupine, I have quills. So any sort of physical structure on the body of the organism that is protective, that would deter a predator, could be considered that type of defense. Lots of organisms have the coloration defense. Uh, very often the coloration defense is camouflage. So they're the same color or similar colors as their surroundings. And sometimes coloration kind of gets linked into this idea of mimicry. Mimicry has some subcategories you don't have to be able to distinguish the two subcategories that I'm showing you. I just want to tell you that they exist. One type of mimic mimicry is what we call Batesian. That's the coral and milk snake example. In that example, two organisms look a lot like each other. They mimic each other. In this case, the mimicking is the coloration. Both snakes are red, yellow, and black. And if you saw it from far away, you might not know which one was which. Same thing for their predators. And so here's the deal. The Texas coral snake, this one up here, uh, is dangerous. It has, on either side of the red marking, yellow bands. Then there's something called the Louisiana milk snake down here. On either side of its red sections, it has black bands. And so there's a little rhyme, red and yellow kill a fellow, red and black venom black. The Louisiana milk snake actually is venomous. It won't kill you with its venom. It might kill you in another way, but not with its venom. But the idea is that since the milk snake looks so much like the Texas coral snake, predators will tend to avoid it if they've encountered a coral snake before because it looks so similar uh, and so the predator might assume that it also is dangerous. 
So it's a benefit for the milk snake. Right? It's getting some protection and it's not even venomous. It doesn't even have the chemical defense, but because it looks like something that does, it's benefiting. The coral snake is really getting nothing out of this deal. Um, it's venomous though, so it's already got that defense. The other type of mimicry kind of reminds me of mutualism, which we'll get to on another slide. It's not quite the same thing, um, but it would apply in the example of the cuckoo bee and the yellow jacket. Both of them are dangerous, so both of them have venom uh, that is dangerous, and they look like each other. So it's like they're doubling up on this defense. Not only do they have the chemical defense, but they also mimic or look like something else that also has the chemical defense. So predators, if they've encountered a cuckoo bee or a yellow jacket, will tend to avoid both of them because they look so similar. Now, if you have questions... Okay, so folks, the next category of interactions between populations uh, are what we would call symbiotic relationships. Sim means the same, bio means life, um, so these are interactions where organisms live together. So in general, all of these symbiotic relationships give a benefit to at least one of the organisms that's in the relationship. If you compare that to the ones that we just looked at, they were very competitive, uh, either because they had the word competition in them or because one of them was eating the other one, generally not an awesome thing to have happen. Now if we take a look at the first one, mutualism. In mutualism, it's mutual. That's what people say when they break up. It was a mutual breakup. That means both parties agreed to it. Um, but in mutualism, both organisms benefit. Benefit. That means they get something good out of the interaction. So I put two little pluses there. It's like a plus plus. Both get something positive from the interaction. So there are lots of examples of this, but the one that's up on the screen is the acacia tree and the bullhorn acacia ant. I watched, I forget which thing it was on. Maybe it was on Planet Earth or maybe it was some other show. I watch a lot of those types of shows. Um, but the bullhorn ant is like a vicious ninja ant. It will attack things that it has no business attacking to try to defend this tree. And the tree is where it lives. So the tree is providing to the ants like a habitat and food and protection. And in return, the ants are acting like little soldiers and protecting the tree from uh, pests and parasites or things that might try to um, eat the leaves or burrow in the trunk. And the ants themselves just coexist uh, very peacefully with the tree. So the tree gets prote protection and the ants get food, shelter, etc. Ants are really amazing. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie where you like they talk it's the ants. Man, ants can do some pretty crazy things. They're super strong for their tiny little body size. This summer I had, I was painting in my backyard and I went to go paint like the little ledge on my back door uh, and there must have been some ants living underneath that. And as soon as I started painting, a bunch of ants started pouring out of there and it was like Antimageddon and I was trying to kill them because they were crawling all over me. I shouldn't have, ants are good, but oh well. Uh, next, symbiotic relationship, so sim the same, bio, life, living together, is parasitism. Uh, a good example would be tapeworms and humans. So there is a tapeworm in a human intestine. I think I showed this class that clip of Grey's Anatomy where she pulls all the worms out, or am I making that up? Oh, we'll do that afterwards. And if you don't want to watch, you don't have to. Uh, I've got some good ideas for uh, parasitism videos. I watched another one where this lady comes back from a vacation and she's got a botfly larva that's burrowed its way into her head. Uh, super awesome. There was an episode of, uh, this is another really good show, Bones. Anything I didn't learn from Grey's Anatomy, I learned from Bones. And the guy comes back from a trip that he went on, but he's an uh, entomologist and he like, wants to help this larva survive, so he purposefully is letting it be burrowed in his neck. Weirdo. Um, oh yeah, this is the best tapeworm video ever. 
Okay, I'm gonna, so just to be clear, in parasitism, one organism benefits and the other is harmed. So I put a plus and a minus. Clearly the tapeworm is the one benefiting. It is getting food and a place to live and the person is being harmed because the tapeworm, um, if it's just one of them is eating some of their food, if it was one billion, like that girl in the video, um, she's having some serious intestinal pain and issues in addition to the tapeworm eating all of the food that comes through her intestines. So that's parasitism. Third one is commensalism, and I feel like Finding Nemo is the classic example of this guy. It's my clownfish and the sea anemone, which is a hard word for my mouth to say, anemone. Uh, but the idea there is that the clownfish, Nemo, uh, can swim through the anemone and receive protection, but the anemone are really indifferent. They're not really getting a benefit from it, but they're not getting harmed by it either. So the description is one organism benefits Nemo, and the other is unaffected. And it's really important that they aren't affected. If they're getting something good, it's mutualism. If something bad is happening, it's parasitism. But if one organism gets a benefit and the other is unaffected, okay, that's commensalism. Some other examples of commensalism um, that sort of exist in general, a plant that grows on or around another plant, a lot of the time would be commensalism. I don't want to say all the time because sometimes that's not what it is. Uh, but sometimes plants just need a structure on which to grow. Uh, and one plant on another one growing, like there's an orchid that will wrap itself around a tree, but it doesn't hurt the tree. Uh, that would be another example of commensalism. Now, this last thing, succession, this is probably the thing that's new to you. It's not a topic that you learned in grade nine and grade seven and grade five, like those symbiotic relationships. Succession by definition is the sequence of invasion and replacement of species in an ecosystem over time. Lots of words there. First, it's a sequence. That means it's a bunch of steps. It's not one single thing. The second, invasion and replacement. It's the idea that over time, as things change in an ecosystem, new species will show up and old species will go away or disappear. It can be driven by biotic factors. So if you recall from Bio 20, that means living, so other organisms, or abiotic factors like the weather, a fire, a flood, uh, that kind of thing. Now there are two categories of succession, and the first one conveniently is called primary succession. Primary succession occurs when, in capital letters, no soil was already present. In other words, stuff wasn't alive there. The two best examples of this, and the only two examples I have ever seen in the context of test questions, are when a glacier retreats. So a glacier is a big sheet of ice, and as the ice retreats, usually because it's melting, rock will be exposed, and nothing is alive there. There's no soil there. There are no plants growing underneath it. It is just rock. Another example of this would be hardened lava, and then stuff will start to grow on top of the hardened lava. There are several examples of this sort of in progress right now in the world, because uh, volcanoes have been erupting uh, in different places. If you're looking for glacier retreating, you don't have to drive very far. You can go to the Columbia Ice Field. My dad used to make me go there all the time when we went camping in the summer. And we take pictures every year of like where the ice was when we went there. Uh, but those two examples, glaciers and lava, uh, Try to use those as cues. If that's part of the question, probably primary succession is the type that you're dealing with. Now, I said it was a sequence, and so these arrows down here are to illustrate the sequence that happens. The first thing to happen, if species are going to invade and replace over time, there has to be a beginning. 
In primary succession, nothing was alive there. So we need a pioneer community. Like the pioneers who came out west and explored, the pioneer community is the first organisms to appear. So when a glacier retreats, for example, and you've got the rock exposed, there'll be cracks in the rock and stuff can fall in the cracks. And that can begin to create soil which could allow small types of things to grow. Moss or lichens, those are usually the things you see as some of the first organisms to grow. So we're not starting with animals. Once they grow and roots start to form uh, and their presence by living and by dying changes the composition of the soil. So when organisms die and decompose, well, whatever they were made of can become part of the soil. And so organisms showing up and then dying as well can help contribute to the soil and making soil. When conditions become favorable, smaller plants will start to replace those pioneer species. So things like smaller grasses or shrubs. Eventually, animals will start to appear, especially when uh, plants that herbivores would use as a food source start to appear. Well, then animals show up as well. When herbivores appear, chances are their predators are going to show up eventually if that's where their food source is. So new species will replace old ones. If you think about the word succession and you apply it to people, uh, a good example would be like the succession in terms of who's going to hold the throne in England. Uh, because they're always in the news, sometimes I look at the chart of succession, like who is next in line. Uh, and so who's going to replace Queen Elizabeth when she either dies or decides not to become queen, but I think she's going to have to die. I don't think she's going to choose. Uh, but it's succession. The new one will replace the old one. And that's what's important in this idea as well. We're not just constantly adding new species to the total, but rather new species come and replace the ones that were there before. Now, eventually, trees will come along. And usually, once you hit trees, you know you're getting to the point where maybe things are going to slow down. Trees are big. Eventually, you're going to get to something that's called the climax community. This is a stable community where instead of organisms replacing others, they're going to live together. It doesn't mean that organisms aren't going to live and die. Of course, they will. Organisms have a finite lifespan and they're still predators and prey. But at that point, we're not having new species replace old ones anymore. We're having organisms live and die, but with the same general species over time. So I've got a little graphic here to show you this process. So this is primary succession, hey? Bare rock, maybe because the glacier retreated. Lichens start going in the cracks in the rocks. Then, I don't know if you can see, but see how it's starting to get darker there? It's trying to illustrate that soil is starting to form, that there's dirt, uh, and that there's organic matter there for organisms to use. You can start seeing right here, small little plants growing. Then the plants get a bit bigger and they get colorful, hey? Grasses and perennials. Then I get bigger, plants, and then I get to some trees, oh, that's right, can't do that, and then at the end, uh, I get to my climax community, where I have these big trees that are there. Now, this succession picture only used plants, there's no animals in it, uh, and not every succession story has both things in it, uh, but hopefully this helps you visualize. I also want to point out down here that it says hundreds of years. That could be changed to thousands or millions of years, depending on the context and the scenario. So succession typically is not quick. It's like evolution. It takes time because all of these organisms have to come and they have to live and die and new ones have to come and live and die for these changes to happen. A really key thing that I want you to notice from this picture is look at how much thicker 
that dark band of soil was getting. That's really distinctive here, this idea that there was no soil and then soil starts to form because of the presence, so the life and then the death, of some of those pioneer species. Now, does anyone want to ask anything about primary succession? Okay. So the other type of succession is secondary. Secondary succession is the result of an ecological disturbance. And so an ecological disturbance is an event that changes the structure of a community. So the implication is that there were already things alive, and this ecological disturbance is changing what's going on for them. And so it's possible that this ecological disturbance destroys all actively growing organisms. So key thing, there were actively growing organisms. There were things that were alive. The first point says it usually does not destroy the soil. So there was soil. So secondary succession happens when you already have a community of populations living together, and then something happens to kill the organisms that are there. Now sometimes, uh, you'll find that plants have uh, spores or seeds that will only germinate after extreme heat. Uh, and so this ecological disturbance could actually be good and help renew things. And so secondary succession is what we call the recolonization of a region after an ecological disturbance. So maybe, like in my picture up there, there was a fire. I had a little forest, so he was happy. There were bushes, grass, trees. Forest fire came along, burned everything. And you can see in picture four at the top that the brown line at the bottom, that's the soil, it was still there. Everything that was above it died, but the soil is still there. Then look what happened. Little grasses, those same purple flowers, kind of smaller shrubs, then trees, then bigger trees. And hopefully you say to yourself, well, gosh, that's the same as it looked on the last one, because it is. It's the same idea, except our starting point was different. We did not need to create soil for nothing. The soil is still there. The ecological disturbance killed everything that was actively growing above it, but we weren't starting from nothing. And so the composition and number of species changes over time the same way it does in primary succession. It just usually doesn't take as long because we're not starting from the same point. We already have soil, so it's like we've gotten a jump start on the process of succession. And just like with primary succession, when you get to the climax community, it is stable. That doesn't mean no organisms live and die, it just means organisms are not replacing other ones in a sequence like they were before.